Heals welcomes you to the third Euro Symposium on Healthy Aging. Heals is the largest non-governmental organization in Europe promoting and advocating scientific research into longevity and biogerontology. Thanks to generous support from our sponsors, Heals was able to organize this conference. The conference will highlight the cutting edge of knowledge in the field of biogerontology and provide a unique opportunity for researchers, government officials, biotech executives and advocates from around the world to meet, network and forge new scientific collaborations. So, first of all, thanks for the invitation to be here. I want to thank Sven also Didier for hosting me the last night at, in his home. So, my, work, my group works on problem misfolding diseases and what I want to explain you today is a specific disease which is called transthyretin amyloidosis. So, transthyretin is a normal problem every one of you have on the blood. Thanks a lot. Yeah, fantastic. Right, so it's made essentially by the liver and then it's secreted to the bloodstream, okay? But TTR, we, we will talk about TTR, not to say transtyretin all the time, is also made in the brain and within the eye. In this case, it remains in the brain because it cannot, it cannot pass the blood-brain barrier. So the function of TTR is to transport the thyroid hormone and vitamin A, so uh, within the blood, and his name, transport of thyroxine and retinol, transtyretin. And uh, there are uh, pathological phenotype which is caused by the abrogation of this problem, okay? So it's an orphan disease caused by the extracellular deposition of amyloid fibrils. So the same type of fibrils you find in Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, but from this problem. Even if it's an orphan disease, it's the most common form of hereditary amyloidosis worldwide, okay? What it causes is nervous or heart pathology of an adult onset. So once you have the first symptoms, your life expectancy is around 5 to 15 years, depending on which mutation you have. And moreover, it's autosomal dominant in most of the cases, right? If you look at the protein, the protein is this one. So this is an homotetrauma. So you have four subunits, total 56 kilodaltons. And if you look at it carefully, indeed it's a dimer of dimers. You can see an axis of symmetry here which is very important for the function, okay? It's essentially a beta sheet protein, so it has eight antiparallel beta sheets. If you ask me where there are mutations that cause the disease, in the gene you can see that they are located everywhere, so there are more than 100 mutations that lead uh, to the onset of the disease. And if you look at the structure where they are located, they are located everywhere, so it's these uh, red points, okay? So you can see that they are in the helices, in the loops, or in the beta sheets. So essentially most of the mutations you have, we only have some of them in blue, which are innocuous, will lead to the onset of the disease. The mechanism is uh, aggregation, of course. So essentially when you have the trauma, that the trauma is safe. It's not completely through, but let's say it like that, it's safe. If the trauma dissociates into the monomers, the monomers misfold, they form oligomers, protofibrils, and fibrils, okay? And all of these species, they are toxic in a different manner. So the curious thing here is that depending on the mutation and on the point of the position, you will have different clinical manifestation of the disease, right? So you will have familial amyloid polyneuropathy if it's uh, deposited in the peripherous nervous. And there are specific mutations that induce this phenotype. You will have uh, familial amyloid cardiomyopathy if you have this mutation, and this will be deposited in the heart, so in the myocard. And this is very important in Africa because up to 4% of the Americans suffer from this disease. You don't have even to have the mutation if you get all, and I will be back to this at the end of my talk, if you get all, the wild type protein can make deposit in your heart, and it seems that 25% of the people that die uh, at the age of 85 or more have these deposits. And you can also have deposits in the brain, and this is what is called CNS, selective amyloidosis. This is very strange, there are only a few cases, but they are extremely aggressive, so they are devastating. Okay. 
So if you look at the phenotype and the therapy, this is a guy just uh, the day they make the diagnostic. So this was polyneuropathic. This is, this is five years later. So essentially people died of what is called wasting syndrome in this case. So essentially they debilitate the tissues and organs and die. And what you have here is kind of contrast image of a guy that has the variant that makes the deposits in the brain and is staining for TTR. And you can see how the, uh, sorry, the, the heart, and how the heart is completely saturated of TTR that promotes malfunction. So, so far what hospitals are doing is liver or combined liver and heart transplantation. It works now, around 85% of the patients survive. But the problem is, okay, which is the rational? The rational, of course, is I want to eliminate the main productor of TTR, so the liver, or the heart if it's very affected. But of course you have to live with lifelong immunosuppression and what it's worth is that even if you put a normal liver, if you have deposits of your mutant protein in your heart or in your nervous, these have a seeing effects. So they are able to recruit the normal protein into aggregate. So after 15 years you usually have to have a new transplant. Okay. So it's clear that we need new drugs for this uh, disease. Let me explain you a little bit the mechanisms in very simple words. So essentially what makes the, the trauma stable and innocuous is that it's a strong barrier for the dissociation, right? So you have to pass energy barrier here to get the monomer. And what the mutations do is they decrease the barriers. So going from the, the trauma to the monomer is not, now much more easy and more, much more fast. And the lowest the barrier, the highest, the, the, the worst the phenotype, right? So it was beginning in the 90s to see that there could be a therapy for that. And this was the observation that when the protein is bind to the hormone, so the hormone is T4, and these are two binding sites in this interface I talked to you about before, the protein is stabilized, it has lower dissociation rates, and of course lower irrigation, right? So having the hormone there is, was saving the irrigation. But the problem is essentially is that 99% of the protein in the blood is the void of the hormone. So essentially it's vulnerable if you want to say like that, okay? And then it comes a second discovery by the group of Jeff Kelly that has been dominating the field for a long time. And it was that when they used, okay, they, there was some doctors using this anti-inflammatory drug and they found that some of the drug was somehow remaining in the blood. And indeed what this drug did is that it bound to TTR. So binding to the same places that the hormone bound, the drug stabilizes TTR, and now it's in phase three clinical trials, okay? The problem with this drug is that it was found by serendipity. So essentially the binding constants are extremely weak. You can take a lot of it because it's quite innocuous, but essentially the problem is that it has a very low affinity. So then it comes drug design exercise, and this is a major advance in the field. So again, the group of Jeff Kelly, after 11 years of research, they developed a drug which was able to stabilize the protein against unfolding and accordingly to prevent the aggregation of the drug in a dose-dependent manner for the polyneuropathic variant and for the cardiac variant. So it works nicely, it proved that the concept that this can be stabilized and preventing aggregation. They solve the crystal structure, the drug fits now in the T4 binding site so perfectly you can buy it, it's Bindacel, right? The problem with Bindacel is that it's extremely expensive because you have to amortize, amortize uh, 11 years of disease. So it's this price for a uh, patient per year. And it's approved in Europe, but it's not approved by the FDA. Okay, but the concept is there. So what we ask ourselves is, can develop a drug that is at least as efficient as uh, Tafamidis, Bindakel is Tafamidis, this is a commercial name, and uh, cheaper? And what we do is we do drug dropper pausing, right? So essentially, if you go to the page of ANH, you will see that this is a kind of estimate that the discovery of new drug uh, and its market approval, so the discovery since the rest of the market is 13 years, the process has 95% of failure and the average cost to uh, deliver a drug is uh, more than 1,000 millions, okay? But it's a way to shortcut this avenue 
is that using a drug that exists for other things for a novel purpose, okay? And there are very famous cases here. So, of course, Sindefanil, which is the famous Viagra, or essentially it was not intended by, uh, for erective dysfunction, you know it was intended for hypertension. As long as you give the drug with the same formulation, you can pass phase one clinical trials very easily and you can go to the market, okay? So this drug and this drug is essentially the same. You know why Viagra is now rhomboid and blue is because this drug was round and white, okay? So you make a differentiation just in the package but you have a new application. And this is another famous drug is finisteride, which is used for propecia, right? Unfortunately, I discovered the drug quite late. <laughs> okay, so what we do is, what you can do is, and this we do it together with a company in Barcelona, what you can do is uh, drug virtual screening. So essentially what you do is you take a reference compound, you generate a molecular field, and then you go to a library of compounds and you compare your molecular field with the molecular field of the compound you want to assess, okay? I will not go much in detail. So what we did in this case, of course, we have a nice drug to compare with. So it's Tafamidis. This is the drug that works nicely. And what we did is we go to a library. You can go, you can buy it. And this contains all the drugs in the market plus those ones that arrive through clinical phase three. Okay, so they are safe. And for any reason, they were not marketed. At the end, we end up with uh, more than 40,000 structures. So we make the alignment. And we end up with 200 top hit compounds that in principle fit well with this molecular structure. When you have the drug, you go to docking, right? So what we did is we removed Tafamidis from here and we dock the 200 compounds. And uh, from those one, we selected 29, including Tafamidis that we redocked, okay? And it docked very well. So now it comes the experimental characterization. For this, I will not go in detail, but essentially we take a mutant which is very aggressive. It's not a natural mutant, it's a mutant we made in the lab. And essentially what you do is you screen for anti aggregational properties. And what you can see here is that, okay, the pipeline of screening is nice, but essentially it fails. Okay, you can see that the, for the 29 compounds we selected, this is the ability of the families to stop aggregation. So the lower the EC50, the more effective the compound. So 28 absolutely were useless. So they don't inhibit anything or they inhibit a very low amounts. But we were lucky enough to find a compound which was in the same range than Tafamidis. And this compound, I can tell you now because we have a pattern, is a tocapone, which is commercial like Tasma. Tasma is used for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. It's a coadjuvant of a catechol methyltransferase, so it's not directly involved, it inhibits an enzyme that degradates levodopa, and then you can have higher doses of levodopa in your brain. It's safe, and in principle, if it works, it will be a candidate, a good candidate. And then we begin with the experiments. So essentially, we, this is the Walter protein. What we did is we take the protein, and we put uh, in urea, so essentially, denaturation curve, and you can see how the Walter protein denatures. But when you have the compound in the medium, the protein is, becomes resistant to the denaturation, so it stabilizes the protein, right? And it does this in a dose-dependent manner, so you can see how with uh, one of the two sites occupied is enough to abrogate 50% of the stabilization, of the destabilization, and then with two binding sites occupied, you completely abrogate the destabilization of their compound. Since stabilization is linked to aggregation, then we tested if it protects from aggregation, and we compare with Tafamidis. So Tafamidis, that is nice. So this is the amount of fibrils you have in the solution when you put the protein to aggregate, and then you put the compound, you can see the tafamidis decreases in a dose-dependent manner fibril formation, but talk upon it as it's much better, you need less concentration. Okay? And what is nice is it also does it for the cardiac variant, which is much more aggressive. So tafamid inhibits, but talk upon it as it's much better. So if it inhibits and stabilizes it, it should bind. And this is what we focus on. So the first thing we did is competition binding experiments. So you use T4. You saturate the protein with T4 and then you put your compound and you see whether your compound can displace or not uh, T4. And uh, talk about it as it four times better than Tafamidis. And the four times better is a constant in all our experiments, okay? So then what we did is ITC, so uh, isothermal, thermal, isothermal cal calorimetry to see which are the binding constants. And here comes the first surprise because in principle, talk about it was better in all the states 
But when you look for the dissociation constant for the first binding site, so remember we have two binding sites, two molecules binding there, okay? Tafamidis is better, right? So six nanomolar, so it's a very high affinity, 21 nanomolar. But what is nice here is that all these compounds that have been described, they have what is called negative cooperativity. So once you bind to the first binding site, the binding to the second site is worse. And the negative cooperativity of tolcapone is lower. So again, four. Okay? So essentially, you can saturate the two binding sites with four less compound. Okay? And what is really nice is the case of the cardiac. It was already known that the family was very bad for the cardiac because it has a lot of negative cooperativity. In our case, there is no negative cooperativity, so we are much better than Tafamidis for the cardiac, right? This is a story of success and lucky because, I mean, we were very lucky because what you want for a compound is that the binding is enthalpically driven, okay? Enthalpy means context. If it's enthalpically driven, it means that it's quite in a specific. And it turns out that most of the energy of binding in this compound and all of them in the case of the cardiac comes from enthalpy contribution. Enthalpy means contact, so you have to solve the crystal structure. We solve the crystal structures of the compound with the, with the proteins, so for the mutant, this is one of the highest resolution structures attained for TTR. And you can see it here, so it docks in the places they are. But what is really nice is that essentially it makes a specific contest with these two lysines here and this glutamic acid here. So essentially it closes the cavity, right? As you can see the cavity here is quite close, much more than Tafamidis, and this is much clearer here. So we were lucky enough that making a specific contest, we close the cavity, and this is multiplied by two because you have two cavities, right? And this explains why it's better. But this, of course, is uh, in vitro, so you have to test this uh, at least in blood, because in blood you have 4,000 proteins, so it should arrive to blood, it should find TTR and stabilize it. So this is a plasma of a wild person, this is a plasma of a ill person, and what we monitor here is how we displace, so we put the drug in plasma and we, we monitor if it displays the T4 that is bound to TTR in plasma, okay? And you can see here that when I have the compounds, both the Famidis and Tolcapone eliminate the binding of T4 to uh, TTR in plasma, right? And accordingly, if it uh, binds in plasma, it stabilizes the protein, right, already in plasma, much more than it does Tafamidis, and this is dose dependent in plasma as well, okay? Uh, inhibiting aggregation is one issue, but what you should target is inhibiting toxicity, right, because at the end the problem is toxicity. What we did here together with people in scripts is using this model of cardiac cells what you do is you generate aggregates and you give aggregates to the cells, which are cardiomyocytes, and what you can see that they are very toxic, so they decrease, when you put the aggregates, you decrease a lot the uh, viability. But if you put the compound, you can see that you rescue it. So essentially the compound by inhibited aggregation rescues uh, viability. It does the same, uh, this is the cardiac variant, it does the same uh, the neuropathic variant in neuroblastoma cells. And this is a very nice system of co-workers in Portugal. So this is cells that secrete the protein. So they want to be like mini liver. So essentially what they do is you have a, a signal peptide that sends the protein. Okay, this is the, here, where is it? Okay, perfect. So this is a, it's a quiz to the medium, right? And then you take the medium and you see whether the protein is aggregated or not. It's very simple. You put a filter, you pass to the filter. If it's aggregated, it will be stuck there. You make a western and you see whether the protein is aggregated or not. Okay, so with this variant, which is very aggressive, you can see that the protein in the medium is essentially aggregated. But when you put the compounds in the medium, okay, it's not longer aggregated. And this means that the compounds, in a way, are arriving to the site where the protein is made. Okay, we go for a mice model, and this is a transgenic model of uh, this neuropathic variant, so three genes, as a human, three human genes, because of course mice are low, shorter life. And the first thing we did now is we are not injecting anything, we are giving them in the food, so this is the idea. 
and where the compound displaces the T4 protein. So whether it finds or not TTR in the blood of these animals. And you can see that again, it displaces the hormone in a dose-dependent manner. And of course, it stabilizes the protein in the blood also in a dose-dependent manner. So these mice can eat uh, Tasma or talk upon it, and then the TTR is uh, stabilized. We went for humans, so we make two healthy volunteers to take Tasma in this case. The doses you take for mild Parkinson or for yeah, terminal Parkinson, and they took the drugs, we took the blood, and we monitor whether the protein in the blood of these uh, volunteers was stabilized. And you can see that. We put the protein under the natural conditions without drug, with drug. It's extremely stabilized. If you take the maximal dose that is proven clinically, it's absolutely stabilized. So you protect absolutely from aggregation in human blood. The thing here is that I don't know how, how much it's going to cost, but essentially now the drug is like 100 times uh, cheaper than the other drug. So this, together with the hospital in Valle de in Barcelona, has gone into clinical trials, has passed already phase two clinical trials, and uh, using six uh, fat patients, so these neuropathic patients, and the data say that uh, it's protection of aggregation in 100% of the patients, right? And so far, the administered region is safe. So it's a drug that is very promising. One thing that we are very excited with is with this kind of uh, Mutants, that remember the mutants that occur in the brain. So they are extremely devastating, okay? They cause a lot of problems. So essentially dementia, stroke in the brain, zitera, and the thing is tafamidis doesn't pass the blood brain barrier. But talcapon is made for Parkinson's. So we don't have any in vivo data, but we, have, uh, we know that the drug binds to uh, these very destabilizing mutants. It inhibits aggregation, and we have already solved the structure of this protein. This protein could not be purified before because it's very aggregation prone, but if you put the compound, you stabilize it and you can crystallize it and it binds in the same manner. And we have a structure for all the other aggressive mutants. Just let me finish with two slides that I put yesterday because when I come here, I didn't know indeed which was the relation with, between TTR and aging. And then I found, looking at the literature, that indeed it seems that there are school that propose that uh, supercentenarians are dying because of amyloidosis, okay? And this, this nice paper I read yesterday that they say that, okay, uh, supercentenarians and trans amyloidosis is the next frontier of human line extension. And then I begin to search in the literature and it found that people that said, okay, that even propose to take tafamidis to uh, elongate the life of centenarians. And then the, looking again, I find the, this web page in which I was, what I was not aware of. And this is a complete web page devoted to the possibility of using tolkapone to extend uh, the life of super centenarians. Okay? And what I found very interesting of these articles is that this sentence, so essentially say there could be other mutations that we don't know, that will have a milder phenotype that we don't notice as a disease but that can be causing aggregation in all people, like senile systemic amyloidosis, okay? And related to that, I have to say you that there are some families in Portugal that they have the very aggressive gene, but they don't manifest the disease. And this was a surprise for many people until they discovered that in the other allele, they have another mutation that acts as a trans suppressor. So there's a mutation that over-stabilizes the protein, right? So the guy that has the very aggressive mutation, but the over-stabilizing mutation doesn't manifest the disease, okay? And this, at that time, was thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to use gene therapy by introducing this stabilizing mutation and abrogating the uh, aggregation of the pathogenic variant, and this has been published, and it did in works in mice, of course, right? And then I was questioning, uh, okay, could be that these all people will have a protective mutation there. And I found yesterday this study, which is really nice, that proposes that this uh, stabilization mutation, which is the T119M, is much more frequent in people with li long life expectancy. Okay? And related to that, we just found a mutation in a 
Portuguese subject, which what it does is it fills the cavity in the same manner that it does an inhibitor. And you guess why when we make sporimons, what happens is that this mutation is extremely stabilizing, right? So the protein doesn't unfold, the protein doesn't aggregate. So it's just a speculation that I get it from this meeting, but it could be that some people have protective mutations and if amyloid is, uh, if TT amyloidosis is important for aging, they are somehow protected, okay? Yes, a speculative uh, issue. And just uh, I finish by thanking the group, so it's a big group, but essentially this is my group, and then the company, and uh, people in the scripts, and people uh, in IBMCA in Porto that provided the mice. And thanks for your attention. Right, so we have time for a one quick question. Uh, well, I mean, it's not so much a question, it's a, a remark. So uh, L. Stephen Coles, whose paper you cited, was actually uh, the, uh, in our scientific advisory board of uh -huh. the organization. And so he has done autopsies in supercentenarians, uh, on 12 supercentenarians, and nine of them died from senal TTR amyloidosis. Yeah. And so that was also the reason why we invited you, because I l uh, read your paper in Nature Communications, which is a nice paper, and it said that your drug actually stabilizes native TTR. And then I was like, okay, this is really yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, to be honest, it was just when you make your introduction that they catch the paper, and it did, it, I mean, talk upon it, and we are the second generation drugs, so we have drugs that are much better, but the thing is, of course, uh, they are made in the lab, so they are not safe. We don't know if they are safe, okay? The nice thing of this story is that it's repurposing, so this is safe. We have better bindings now, but it, it has to go to all the toxicity assays. But the nice thing here for aging is that if it's good for something, it's good for the wild type, okay? It's good for the other ones as well, but for the wild type, it has a very high affinity and specificity. So I'm very happy to be here because I have learned a lot of that and it opens for us another research line. Thank you. Okay, maybe some question? One? Okay. Um, we, it is quite known now that uh, about up to 25% of people uh, age 85 have uh, amyloid deposits in their hearts. Uh, but to what extent is this really clinically relevant? I mean, do they really die already in their 80s from this, or is it just like a, something you find on an autopsy? I'm sorry, but I am, I am not the person to, to uh, respond to that. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, th what I read is essentially that they have it. And if you look for, we were looking for, uh, so our target or the target of these people that w is working on these inhibitors is the cardiac variant. Because the cardiac variant is uh, made in the States and you have all this population, so it's a lot of market there. And what is, uh, what is surprising of this problem is that, uh, I mean, the binder can't stabilize even very, very destabilized the problem. But when you solve the crystal structure, you don't see any features that account for the instability, right? So it's not, it's, it's not a specific clue we can target, because when you solve the crystal structure, the drug fits very well the two surfaces and it's there, right? So it's like the wild type. And if you, if you don't have the drug, you cannot solve the structure. So essentially it's like that. So I cannot answer your, your, your question. Okay, so thank you, Salvador. Okay. <laughs>